So how do we show up for life with learning, with landscapes of practice? Dr. Etienne Wenger championed landscapes of practice alongside his previous work with other people around communities of practice. He defines communities of practice as groups of people who share a concern or passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly, regularly, often. <laughs> <laughs> to, so to give you an example of a community of practice, in a previous life of mine, in the veterinary world, when learning how to restrain a, an animal at college, I went to the lectures, I went to the practicals, I practiced with a stuffed dog, and then I went on placement. Wow, that was a whole new concept. When you're restraining a dog that just wants to bite your face off because your colleague has put a thermometer where that dog did not want that <laughs> thermometer to go, <laughs> that is really a whole new concept. And my knowledge went from explicit to embodied, just like that. But of course, I had the support of my peers around me. They, they gave me advice before, <coughs> after, and during my first time of, of practicing that technique. And the days and months that followed, whilst I was in that surgery, the nurses, the vets, whoever, we all shared knowledge and techniques. And that was a community of practice. And that is one of my communities of practice that has shaped my landscape of practice. So a landscape of practice is a reflective journey on your communities of practice that enable you to find your identity, your knowledge base, know who you are and who you're becoming. Life's a learning curve. We can't escape that cliche. The curves can go up, the curves can go down. We don't always have control of those curves. So how can we cope with that point of inflection? You may be wondering what a social learning theory has got to do with coping with those curves. I'm stood here in this wonderful university, a learning platform, a centre of research. I'm very proud to be a Lincoln graduate in animal management and welfare. So how have I gone from that to what I do now, identifying myself as a social art practitioner? Let me introduce you to Mikey. Mikey is the most beautiful, wonderful human being on this planet. Of course I'm biased, he's my son, now 18. Reverse 19 years and I had the pregnancy test and it had two blue lines on back in the days before it spelt it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was so proud so happy, so excited. I always wanted to be a mum. I used to love playing with my dolls. I knew that one day I wanted to be a mum. But I was also very scared. I didn't know how to be a mum. Do any of us know how to be parents before we are a parent? They certainly don't come with guidebooks. But I was also very aware of the very real concept that my mother wasn't a good role model and my baby growing needed me to be everything that she wasn't. July 2000, Mikey entered the world. He was four weeks early because his heart traces were low. At 24 hours old, he became critically ill. He had multi-organ failure, he had to be ventilated and he had internal bleeding. The doctor came to me and said, would you like to hold him while he goes to sleep? I knew what this meant. He wouldn't wake up. For the last 24 hours, I wanted nothing more than to hold my little boy. I hadn't been able to because he'd been so poorly. And that feeling went from there to flat on the floor. I said, no, no way. You do your best for my boy. And they did. 
and he did. And Mikey fought. At 10 days old, I got my first cuddle. He was off the ventilator. He was heading the right way. At six weeks old, I took him home. There's nothing more that I loved than my identity as being Mikey's mum. The days that, and weeks and months that followed were a plethora of appointments and therapies. And with each one became, seemed to become a bittersweet diagnosis. Each new diagnosis gave me answers that I desperately needed and we needed to be able to deal with him and help, help him. But at the same time, every diagnosis hurt. I became isolated. All my previous communities of practice, whether work or social, they vanished. And it might be that they found it easier to do that. They didn't know what to say, like you spoke of the elephant in the room. But they vanished. So I tried to immerse myself in parent baby groups. But that didn't work. I found myself comparing my still struggling little boy to the other babies that were reaching their milestones. Quite rightly, their parents were celebrating and talking about their milestones, but for me, I just couldn't cope with it, so I stepped back from them. I could feel myself spiralling. I could feel myself becoming the one person that I didn't want to become, my own mother. So after a few years, Mikey was at a local special school and this allowed me to find, to try and find the identity that I needed. As I said before, being Mikey's mum is the best identity in the whole world and I'm the luckiest person because I get to say that. But I needed my own identity as well. And because he was at school, it gave me the flexibility to try and do that. So I couldn't return to work because Mikey was still having 800 million appointments and quite often needed to be picked up from school due to being unwell or from a seizure. So I came to uni, hence my earlier reference to being a Lincoln graduate. I was very lucky that my tutors were really supportive of my situation and allowed me to complete. I had a new community of practice I belonged. After uni, I used my newfound knowledge and passion around veterinary infection control and MRSA in animals to secure some guest lecturing with the British Veterinary Nursing Association. Again, my voice mattered. I felt like I belonged. I still didn't quite know where I was going, but for that moment in time, that community of practice was right for me. Around the same time, I found an online forum called Special Kids in the UK. Essentially, a parent support group, all parents with children with different needs. And yes, it was a support group, but it was also a knowledge, and still is, a knowledge sharing group, a community of practice. Any parent of a child with different needs will tell you that it's a battle to get our children what they need. We must never feel sad for, we, we must never have sympathy for them because they don't want or need that. Sometimes f feel sad because they're struggling, but not sympathy. Twice in the last 18 years, I've had to resuscitate Mikey. No parent should have to go through that. I wanted to wallow. I wanted to reflect on what had happened and what might have happened. But I didn't. I couldn't. Mikey didn't, so why not take his lead? Mikey was happy to be in this world and he wanted everyone to know. So time moved on a bit. We went through four years of Mikey being on a medically controlled ketogenic diet. This is a diet that for some helps control seizures. And for Mikey it's a miracle, absolute miracle. It has saved his life. When he was 12 years old, 
He wasn't expected to make it to 13 due to the complexities and severities of his seizures. But thanks to the ketogenic diet, over three years, he went from having up to 100 seizures or spikes in a 24-hour period to hardly any. It's his miracle. Consequently, the real Mikey emerged. <laughs> and that is, on the whole, really positive. The poor boy had been kept locked in almost by anti-epileptic drugs or, and or epileptic seizures. But now he was very much alive, very much letting the world know that he was alive. However, with that became a very real need for him, for routine. And he was very adverse to change. So much so that if I moved the, the mat, the rug, in the living room, even an inch, he couldn't cope with that. And it was very tedious. And it got on my nerves, but I understand that that gave him his safe world. At 16, there was change. None of us could have predicted it. Had we been able to predict it, would we have been able to help him? We don't know, because Mikey's very much here and now. There's no there, there's no then, it's now. Mikey couldn't cope with this change. I became the safe person for Mikey to pop with, to the point where, for weeks, my arms were black and blue. <coughs> his violence became his new routine. He couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop it. There's nothing more heartbreaking than seeing your son in a whirl of anxiety and not being able to cure it with a cuddle. I made the hardest decision I have ever had to make in my life. I couldn't look after Mikey anymore on my own. It wasn't safe. So I set the wheels in motion to try and find a residential setting that would give him what he needed to be safe and to thrive. In that time, by luck or judgment, with the help of the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services and sadly some medication, Mikey found his equilibrium again. I got my smiley boy back. So at the same time, I could not ignore what had just happened. It was a massive wake-up call as to what the future might hold. And so, maybe selfishly, I decided I, I couldn't make that decision again. I'd made it once, and it was the hardest decision ever. But I've decided to wait until Mike is an adult. That, in turn, gives a couple of years for careful transition and planning. And plus, as an adult, he has a right to his own level of independence within his capabilities and his own little communities of practice. But over the two years that followed, I felt absolute immense guilt and pain, but mainly guilt. I could see my boy happy and knowing that change was the reason why I made the decision I had to. I was just going to inflict more change. I, I couldn't fathom that at all. And it was a point of inflection. I decided I need to reflect on my landscape of practice and where I was going. And so I thought about training to be a learning disability nurse. But I knew that was out of guilt and not out of vocation. So one of my community of practices that I haven't spoke about yet, but you've heard slightly about, is in the world of arts. Art has always been my saviour, whether it's music, playing, sometimes badly, or visual art practice. So I'm from the dark side of being a self-taught artist. And I love creating commissions. I love making people smile. But that wasn't enough. I knew from what I'd just been through I wanted to make a difference. And I thought about Mikey and, and his experience and what might have made a difference to him. And on reflection, there wasn't that much out there that was inclusive, that he could have enjoyed his own personal experience of the arts. 
So I set up a club, and it was just a little club for children with disabilities. And we had, and still have, great fun. So, from that, I went to where I am now. I had to do some formal training, but that alongside my experience. I now work with adults and children with disabilities, home educated ch um, community, some commercial entities because we all need some bread and butter. And I have the best job in the world. I believe I am making a difference. My aim is to bring these communities together and create more inclusive communities of practice. It's actually only 10 days since Mikey moved into his new home. And I hope that by me standing here and showing up, because inside I am, I am an absolute ball of pain still, but I hope from that, that you feel you can look at your landscapes of practice and see how you can make a difference and show up for life. Thank you.